I'm Betty Johnson, Assistant Dean for Faculty and Staff Diversity, Development and Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where we are committed to solving serious health and social problems facing the world. Our success in addressing these issues has huge implications for the future. No factor is more important to this pursuit than outstanding leaders. Therefore, the goal of Voices in Leadership is to highlight the experiences of those confronting these major challenges and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can affect change. We believe these lessons and insights should be shared widely and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and welcome to Voices in Leadership. I'm Eric Anderson, the Deputy Director of this program and I have the privilege to introduce our guest today. Today's discussion is going to focus on communicating for causes and issues, and we have two leading experts in this field with us today. Karen Finney was a senior advisor and senior spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. She was also the communications director for vice presidential nominee, Senator Tim Kaine. Karen has a wide range of experiences in media, politics, and communication strategy, including hosting her own television show on MSC, MS, MSNBC called Disrupt with Karen Finney. She also served as communications director at the Democratic National Committee. Karen is currently a resident fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics. A veteran of politics since 1990, Doug High served in leading communications positions. In the House of Representatives, he was deputy chief of staff for communications for House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. He served in the United States Senate, the Republican National Committee, as well as serving in the George W. Bush administration. He is currently a CNN political commentator and contributor to the Wall Street Journal. Doug served as a resident fellow at the Harvard IOP in the fall of 2015. Before I turn the session over to today's moderator, Dr. Meredith Rosenthal, Professor of Health Economics and Policy and the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, please join me as we welcome Karen Finney and Doug High to Voices in Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure to serve as moderator for this conversation with Karen and Doug, two veterans of politics and policy. Uh, as Eric noted, today we'll be focusing, as usual, on an opportunity to elicit leadership lessons from Doug and Karen. Uh, but this is also a time that we can really talk about the importance of effective communication. So I took the liberty of watching some interviews with you both um, <laughs> on the internet. Uh -oh. So I know you'll be more <laughs> comfortable if I continuously interrupt you and speak it's over fine. you. Uh, but, but I will try not to do that. I, I very much encourage this uh, to be a conversation, however, so please do join in um, with questions of your own as you see fit. Uh, so I want to start by asking you, Karen, and then Doug, to reflect a little bit of some of the leadership lessons that you've accrued over the years in your work. Uh, you know, I think the most important lesson, and I think Doug would agree with this, certainly as a communications person, is that um, your integrity is really critical, it, that people need to know that the information that you're providing, uh, that they can trust it, um, that it is uh, the information that they need, whether you're talking to a reporter who's trying to report on a story, uh, even if you can't give them the answer they want, they, I think people need to know that you're you know, trying to do the best you can to give them the best information. Um, you know, I had, I think, a, an experience that was very relevant to this when I worked at the New York City Board of Education uh, during 9-11. And one of the issues in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, as we were trying to reopen some of the schools in the Ground Zero area, was the quality of the air. And that was a real challenge because, you know, it was working with our uh, scientists to understand what information I could share in terms of you know the processes that we were going through i had to, i learned a whole lot about uh, air molecules that i had never <laughs> known so of course i was you know trying to translate sort of political communications and understanding that but that was a really uh, i think critical lesson in how important it is to get those get that information right and be accurate and i think that's particularly important when you're talking about policy um, because obviously if you you know, give misinformation or if you're off, it can, it can actually make a big difference uh, in the way people understand what's happening. And in that instance, obviously, we were trying to make people feel comfortable 
uh, with the idea of bringing their children uh, back to school. Thank you. Doug? I, I think it's largely the same thing. Um, in, in politics, relationships last a very long time. And the uh, member of Congress that you're going to work with uh, may end up not only being in Congress for a long time, but maybe a committee chair that you work with, maybe a senator. Um, in some cases, uh, not necessarily with a member of Congress yet, but, but certainly with senators, may become president. These relationships last a long time, and they certainly last a long time uh, with reporters. Um, I would imagine that um, the beat reporter at the New York Post that Karen worked with when she was talking about reopening schools and air quality might have been some of the same people that she's dealing with now. Might have been Maggie Haberman, you know, at the New York Times, who's now covering the president, you know, every day um, for, the, for the New York Times. And that's where your integrity really comes into play. Um, if you lie to a reporter, um, if your boss lies to a reporter, uh, that's going to be not only a reflection on you, but it's going to be a reflection that is widely shared uh, amongst the, uh, uh, their colleagues, whether it's in the Capitol or on the campaign trail, um, and ultimately is going to hurt your, your credibility with them. And um, that is the thing that, as, as we've seen, kind of confidence erode um, the question that I've gotten a lot from um, journalism, I, I spoke uh, last year to um, the School of Journalism at North Carolina, um, my alma mater, and I was asked the question of how often would I lie to a reporter? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, given what we've seen, not just in the past year, but re really the past 10, 15 years, um, has really eroded the confidence that people have in the integrity, not just of their public officials, but certainly the person who's at the podium or on the t TV screen defending it. Um, obviously this year has, has brought some new challenges. Um, but the other thing I would add is, is consistency. Um, and especially um, when you're talking about a member of Congress, a senator, a president, um, knowing that their, um, that, their core, that their core is not going to change. Their opinions on a particular issue may change, but who they are you know, doesn't change. That they're somebody that you can work with um, is, is a strong signal that not only members of, of the journalism community look at, but certainly their colleagues. I think a great example of that is uh, former Vice President Biden. Um, not only had he had long relationships with everyone on Capitol Hill, because he had been there since 1972, uh, but everyone, know, uh, everyone knew and respected Joe Biden. Um, I remember an example when he called Eric Kanner, as he was wont to do from time to time, and said, I need your help on the Violence Against Women Act. And when Joe Biden calls and says, he needs your help, the answer is yes because you also know that he's going to be a partner that you can work with. And it's that kind of long-term consistency uh, that people look at as, as well and really depend on. And again, that may be a reflection of what we're seeing right now, but um, I think that's critically important. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, and, and both of you in your remarks, you, um, you set up a, an issue that I really wanted to ask you about, which is that in many instances when you're communicating with the public, you're an agent for a candidate, for a campaign, for an elected official, uh, and there's this question of your, your own authenticity. Integrity um, clearly is important here. <clears throat> But when, um, when you speak on behalf of a campaign, to what extent um, do you allow your authentic self come in? Or you know, if we saw you speaking the next day to the alumni from whatever illustrious institution you graduated, would a very different person show up than when you show up on behalf of the campaign? How do you navigate that? You know, this goes to what Doug was saying about uh, consistency, because I personally believe and uh, tried to do this both as a spokesperson for someone else when I had my own television show, when I uh, was a commentator, I wanted people to see the same person. Obviously, when you're speaking for yourself, it's a little different. You can <laughs> you can say some things maybe you you wouldn't say, uh, because also you're when you're speaking for someone else, you're reflecting their perspective, their opinion, um, a process perhaps that you're a part of which is different when you are asked to give your opinion on something. So obviously you have to be mindful of the differences, but I think you know it's so important, particularly in this era, I think when we talk about media, to remember that we are talking about it's television, it's radio, it's multimedia, it is you know the social media platforms, everything is in an instant, it is 24-7. Um, you know, it is around the world. So I think that for people to be able to see a consistency in who you are and how you carry yourself, even if, uh, you know, if I were to give you my opinion on a particular issue that might vary from the, ish the perspective that the person I am representing has, I still, you know, think it's important that you give your authentic self 
um, because that also goes to your credibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I've been fortunate. I've never been asked to defend something truly indefensible. Um, but when you have to, well, before you go out and defend something you don't necessarily agree with, it's your job as the communications person to you know, tell that elected official, tell that candidate why you think this is a mistake, what you think the possible reverberations will be. Um, and you'll fight that tooth and nail until the decision is made. Once the decision is made, that's it. And it's your job um, to then go then go and not only defend that, but espouse that and, and promote that. I, I won't lie, sometimes if it goes badly, um, there's a point of pride there that you can go back to that member of Congress or that <laughs> candidate and say, you know, see, I told you so. This was a terrible idea. Um, um, you know, that, that is what we'll sometimes call a touch the stove moment, that a politician needs to touch the stove, realize it's hot, and not touch it again. Um, that also helps build more credibility you know, with that elected official, with that candidate. Now, the reverse may be true as well. They may be right and you could have been wrong, in which case you need to have internally a very big mea culpa um, and say, yes, boss, you were right, which is what every politician wants to hear. Um, but the other thing I, I would say about that is um, to, to the consistency that, consistency that Karen talked about, it's really important, not just with your work colleagues, um, your fellow communicators, your political directors, your fundraisers, whatever, it's, it's more important to uh, the press corps, I think, um, because they're the people who are going to judge you every day, um, in print, on TV, on various platforms. They're the ones who are going to give you the benefit of the doubt or not give you the benefit of the doubt in a story, which may, may mean you get to insert your quote or not. Um, and also, which I, I think people don't, don't realize, when folks are hiring communications folks on the Hill um, or in campaigns, you know, there's obviously an interview process, which is pretty standard that probably isn't any different than most organizations, except uh, we'll often talk to reporters um, and ask them, have you worked with this person? What do you think about them? And I can tell you in a couple of circumstances I've had where if, if a reporter has told me not to trust that person, I took that to heart. If they said they, did, they had never heard of that person, I took that to heart as well. Um, reporters weirdly can be because there's this symbiotic relationship of where, you know, you have to trust your boss, you have to, to some extent, trust the press, and you, you serve two masters, so to speak, um, that the relationship with that reporter can be really important to what feedback they give you um, is something that, that's important to you, to your office, and can really help in staffing as well. Can I just add one thing also? I mean, to this, also this point of being sort of a conduit, uh, and the touching the stove. I mean, there's one phrase I always teach uh, young press people, which is what he or she meant to say was, <laughs> because I promise you, you will use that at some point mm -hmm. in your career. But I think also part of our job, as Doug was saying, I mean, we are both, you know, I've always felt like on the one hand, part of your job is to make sure that your boss understands the climate in which they're about to speak mm -hmm. or how this issue is playing out. Um, and I've seen that both in the private sector and the public sector. And a lot of times the way the conversation goes is you'll try to, you know, you kind of say, well, let's, what, what do you think you want to say? Mm -hmm. And, they, and they, you kind of talk it out. And sometimes our job is to say, well, let me tell you how I hear that. Let yeah. me tell you how I think people might hear that. Because, you know, part of what you're also trying to help in effectively communicating, no matter what the issue mm -hmm. actually is, whether it's a political issue or a policy issue, um, you want to make sure that you're helping the person say what they are intending to say and that the particular audience doesn't have perhaps some other some reason why they wouldn't hear it that way that you want to make sure the person is, is aware of. And again, I think when it comes to policy, that's particularly important because you know, it, particularly when you're working with a politician or member of Congress, you, you want that policy to be well received. Mm -hmm. And part of doing that is to say, well, here are some of the points I think you need to make that people are really going to be listening for. Yeah, and Republican politicians, most of them at least, are very fearful of being called mean. And so whether you're talking health care reform, whether you're talking immigration or a whole host of issues, that is a central fear that they have. So for the communicator or the communications director or the press secretary working with that member to make sure that uh, what they that they know that what people hear is more important than what they say and how they channel that 
um, is as important um, as anything else. And the problem for Republicans is, is that other 25% who tend to get picked up more, who don't worry about being called mean, that <laughs> define us all. But for the 75%, it's a, it's a very real process of, um, as they're trying to explain legislation, figure out, formulate where they are on a particular bill, um, that that's a big part of it. Interesting. Thank you. I, I can't help but notice that the White House has been dealing with crises uh, quite a bit these days. Mm. And, <laughs> and some of them bit. are internally generated and some of them are external. Of course, um, we've had um, many terrible tragedies over mm. the last number of weeks. Um, I, I was trying to think about communication in those circumstances. And I know you've both dealt with crises of a whole variety of kinds. Uh, and I wonder if, um, if you could identify uh, the biggest mistakes that communication um, experts make when there's an internal crisis and an external crisis? Like, wh what is it that one should avoid uh, when it's the first opportunity to communicate with um, the constituents when something has gone wrong? Uh, not being prepared. And, I, and by that I mean, you know, to your point, there are the uh, self-inflicted <laughs> wounds, which we've seen quite a few of those uh, in the last few months. And then there are the things that you can control, like a hurricane, for example. Or if you, I mean, particularly working with politicians, part of, you know, when you're running for office, one of the things you do is kind of self-research to know where those points are that would be ripe for an attack of some kind, and then to be prepared for that. Um, I personally always think, again, this goes to everything we've been talking about. It was in a situation actually in the, at the New York City Board of Education where we discovered a scandal and uh, we were learning the information uh, kind of in real time because of relationships that I had with the reporter who initially called me about it. I was able to buy us a couple of hours to try to get the accurate information. And my advice to my boss was, We've got to get out as much of this as we can on our terms uh, so that we are seen as being part of the solution, not part of the problem and holding back information. I think sometimes, whether it's a self-inflicted wound or whether it's um, you know, something that comes uh, in real time, sort of a disaster, the instinct is, you, you know, I think sometimes people think they're, they're trying to get it right, so you're not quite sure how much to tell. And I, sir, I just have the belief that more is better um, because I think the more, again, you're seen as being part of the solution and really trying to work to get the information out, I think you're in a, a much better place. Any insights, Doug? No, I, I agree with every word of that. Um, I would say, you know, Karen and I have done a lot of television and there's a phrase that you hear that says, when the red light goes on, because there's always a red light on top of the camera, anything can happen. And I don't think that's ever been truer than with Donald Trump as our president. And what I mean by that is, um, to the preparedness, I've been really impressed with the job that FEMA has done. And I initially was skeptical of the job they would be able to do because they're still a little short-staffed. Um, I think the press conferences with um, Tom Bossert, the national security aide for the president, have been very good. Um, unfortunately, they're not really the red light. Donald Trump is. And so whether it's his Twitter feed or comments that he's made, um, especially with, with Puerto Rico, um, he makes the situation um, not as good as it should be, to put it mildly. Um, and what's troubling is not only does he get in his own way um, politically, but he gets in the way of his administration to do the job that it should be doing, which is, you know, I think a lot of what we've seen just in the, in the past few days. Um, the, the fights with the mayor uh, seem to serve no purpose. I, I don't think that would help Donald Trump. Um, I also worry simultaneously that given everything that we've seen from Trump, we pick at every word that he says so much to the point that like, he's not the most loquacious, eloquent person in the world, right? And he's never going to be. But so we look at his statement when he sent, sent the warmest condolences um, after the shooting. It's, God, how can he say that? Well, I'll give him a little bit of a benefit of the doubt on that, and I don't give him much of a benefit of the doubt on anything. That's the way he talks. Is it, is it awkward? Sure. But it's not the proactive um, things that really get in the way of you know, helping people who are in need the way that we've seen with the fight from um, you know, the, the mayor of San Juan or you know, larger um, Puerto Rico and that it's massively in debt and why that would have anything to do with anything. Those kinds of things really hurt the preparedness of you know, the people who, who work on these things every day who are pros 
who are trying to do the good job of making sure that everything is happening that needs to happen, even you know, in a terrible situation like Puerto Rico, they're doing the good work, and then the president comes in you know, from above and really complicates their efforts. But I also think one of the problems this administration has, and Donald Trump is, you're right, he's the red light, is, um, and having been through this when I worked in the Clinton administration uh, with Whitewater, I mean, part of what you do in a situation like that is, you know, we had a team that was, they were dealing with Whitewater. So when Mike McCurry was at the podium and he got a question, reporters knew that his answer would be, you've got to call, you know, this person because that's who's dealing on it. Now, in that instance, everybody was on the same page, including mm -hmm. the president, in terms of what the strategy was. What I think we've seen time and time again, when it appears that there was a, a strategy that they were trying to have in place, the person who blows that <laughs> up is Donald Trump. Yeah. Whether he tweets something that's counter to what we were just told in the briefing or to the information that you can mm -hmm. tell others in the administration are trying to put out to the press. So that's the other sort of big mistake I think that gets made yep. uh, or can get made is once you decide on what your plan is, you have to stick to it and you have to make sure mm -hmm. the boss who's got the biggest microphone, you know, loudest mm -hmm. megaphone really is on the, the same page because then it's sort of, you really then just kind of destroy all the good work and the credibility and then nobody knows exactly what to believe or what's true. Yeah. And that's when they have a strategy, which we don't know that they always do. True. <laughs> I was trying to, you know. <laughs> I got you, don't worry. I, I, I want to take a moment to uh, have an opportunity to have our online um, folks join the conversation mm -hmm. a bit. And I have a question from online that I want to share with you that was is initially framed um, to you, Karen, but I, I would really love to have both of you mm -hmm. talk about this a bit. Um, so Karen, you wrote an op-ed regarding your family history and the tensions around uh, the monuments that we've talked about, Robert E. Lee's mm -hmm. continued um, exaltation in certain areas. At, at this critical point with racial tensions flaring uh, and the absence, this is, I'm quoting, um, uh, and the absence of moral leadership in our political arena, how do we, um, engaged in, in policy, uh, particularly around public health and social justice as we do here, how do we have these conversations uh, about race yeah. uh, and, and how do we translate the conversations, um, which we hope will be more, more open and honest than in the past, into real action? You know, I, I think it takes a lot of courage. And for those who don't know, the piece that I wrote uh, on my mother's side, we, I am a descendant of Robert E. Lee. Her name is Mildred Lee. And on my father's side, um, we're descended of slaves. And he was a civil rights attorney and she was a social worker. Um, and they met in New York. Uh, and my mother's family basically never came to the wedding, was not at all supportive of their marriage. And so I wrote that piece to try to say, look, family is complicated, history is complicated, these issues are very complicated, um, and it takes a lot of time, but I think it takes a lot of honest conversations. You know, my grandmother, my mother's mother, kind of would repeat some of the same uh, mythology about Robert E. Lee and the lost cause and the war of northern aggression, <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, Grandma, sure that's quite how that happened um, you know let's talk about it that's not quite my experience um, and look she never was able to let go of that but but she sure loved me and 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 so that's progress and so I think it's really um, you know around uh, Trayvon Martin I thought one of the thing his his death and, and, and one of the things that came out of that that I think was so positive you know People started to have that conversation uh, with friends when they realized um, that if they had a male African American friend, they had been given the talk about here's what you do if you're pulled over by the police, here's how you behave. And Jonathan Capehart, who's a wonderful writer for the Washington Post, wrote a great piece about how he was starting, people were asking him, well, tell me about that conversation. So I think it's about having the courage both to ask the questions of the people in your lives that you know, um, and if you are that person, to, to be willing to engage in that conversation. Because I really think that is how we make change in this country. We can legislate, we can you know, gr have great policy, but it's really that interpersonal level where uh, I think real change happens. Do you want to add to that? Doug? Yeah, I mean, and I, th I think Karen knows my, my kind of history in the Republican Party and race is a unique one. My first job was for Jesse Helms, 
Then I went to, later on, work for Michael Steele when he was running for Senate and then at the RNC, so the first African-American RNC chair, um, and then worked for Eric Kanner, the um, highest ranking Jewish Republican um, elected official that we've ever had. So there's a lot happening right there. Um, and I've been pretty critical of where you know, the Republican Party is on race. Um, we seem to get it wrong a lot. And so where we get it right, um, I, I try and highlight as much as I can. I don't think there's a better example than that than Nikki Haley, um, who, and I, I grew up in North Carolina, and I know what a tricky issue, to put it mildly, the Confederate flag is there. And every county has a courthouse with a statue of a soldier, right? And it's not a World War II or World War I soldier. Um, it's Jedediah whomever, right? Um, and um, what she did was remarkably, was remarkable in what she did, but it was very difficult. And she had to really navigate a lot of difficult waters to make sure that um, some folks thought she was gonna be doing too much. Some, some folks thought she was gonna be doing very little. So she tried to work with all sides to get people to buy in um, and the business community as well. So it wasn't just elected officials. Um, to realize that obviously what happened at, at um, Ebenezer AME Church in Charleston was a flashpoint for um, not just that community, but kind of the, the broader issue. Um, there's still, still going to be issues with South Carolina on this. I, I know in North Carolina, I'm not being facetious when I say we will have, you know, 100, there are 100 counties in North Carolina, instances of, you know, this statue, do we take it down or not? I used to live in Richmond. Um, where Monument Avenue is almost all Confederate soldiers, um, except for Arthur Ashe, which was its own controversy, certainly. Um, I, by the way, I always thought they should have put it at the tennis courts that he wasn't allowed to play at because he was black. Yeah. I thought that would have been a smarter move, but it's fine. He's on Monument <laughs> Avenue, it's great. I like Arthur Ashe. Um, but where we get it right, we need to highlight that because when we get it wrong, it gets highlighted for us by the media. Um, and it's not just a you know, a member of Congress. It's every time a state party treasurer makes a stupid joke about the Obamas. It's when a House staffer makes a Facebook post about the Obama daughters, which was stupid and wrong. Um, I don't think that should be front page of the Washington Post and front page of the Metro section and front page of the style section, which it was in one day. Um, that kind of overkill, I think, makes it even more important um, that our better voices, our better angels speak loudly um, to really counterbalance that. I wish we had more time for this conversation. I would love to ask you about how we hold this conversation about race in this country and at the same time hold a conversation about class, social mobility that's broader another time. Um, <laughs> but since I'm a health economist, I have to squeeze in a short question. Absolutely. We'll have to keep the answer short in, in the limited time we have left. But I, I do want to ask you both about the Affordable Care Act, uh, since I know you're both so knowledgeable. Uh, as you, you may have uh, read, Atul Gawande, one of our faculty members, has written recently about finding common ground on uh, coverage expansion. Uh, and, and really, in his message, as I read it, uh, is that really to find that common ground, we need to dig into the values discussion and really really hear each other about the values that uh, animate both proponents and opponents of the ACA. And uh, I wonder, you know, where you see this conversation. Are we going to continue to have skirmishes at the front line here around the ACA? Um, can we move forward uh, with health security in this country in a different way, in a bipartisan way? Doug, do you want to start? Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, we, we will. We will continue to have skirmishes on this. And the reason why is Republicans can't agree on anything when it comes to health care. Um, we are all over the map. I can tell you in 2014, when I was working for Eric Kanner, uh, we put together a group um, to come up with what the replacement bill would be. We spent six months on this. Um, met with the relevant members of the, of the committees of jurisdiction, which included Paul Ryan. Um, Tom Price was sometimes in those meetings. Um, every other week, staff met every week. We were never able to put a white paper together. We were never able to really get past the meeting phase. Um, and so it was going to take a Republican president to make that happen. And what we've seen are real fits and starts. So we have a president who should be able to make these things happen, and it's not being made happen. Whatever you think of whatever the House bill or the Senate bill may be, they can't agree on anything. And if the Senate had passed its bill, I don't know that the House would have then passed that same bill. Um, so I think we'll be at a stalemate for a while, just on the, on the Republican side. I mean, I, I agree with that because just given the way Congress is set up right now, uh, 
Democrats couldn't get done what we would want to get done. But I think this is a fundamental problem, sort of going back to this values question, and I will get a little partisan here. I think we don't start at the same place with what we're trying to accomplish. Democrats are trying to expand coverage for everybody, and we're trying to do it in a way that recognizes that there are cultural differences, there are economic challenges, there are a range of challenges that can't just be fixed by tax cuts here or block grants there. Um, you know, the Affordable Care Act, the whole intention from the beginning was, let's get this passed, then let's work together to fix it, to make it better and make it work for people. That's the Republicans have started from the place of, let's destroy anything with Barack Obama's name on it, and that's not how you get good policy. I'm sorry to have to end it here, but I just Don't want to <laughs> draw out a few a few uh, things that I heard uh, really about communication in particular around these critical uh, policy issues uh, around integrity, the importance of consistency, uh, and um, and I think in your early remarks, Karen, you also talked about the importance of figuring out how to translate science and other concepts and really understand how your audience is going to receive them. So I want to thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.